Welcome to Shotgun Story, the podcast that has conversations with indie creators about music, meaning, and the point of it all, so that you may be inspired by the journeys of other artists who are doing it for themselves, and maybe gain a little more understanding as to why it matters quite so much that you keep creating. Matthew van der Wand is a South African musical legend and my songwriting hero. And he's in studio and I'm going to try not to fan go. Hi, Matthew. Hello. It's so nice to be here and I'm very glad you asked me to come and talk. I hope I'm going to have something to say, but I haven't been terribly active in the music world for a while. This is definitely not what that's about. It is your inspiration and what drives you. That's what I'm looking for and I am very excited. You are, you definitely will have stuff to say. Cool. So I'm going to start with what led you here? Why music? Well, I mean, that in itself is a complicated question because I don't really do only music these days and haven't for some time. I, I did it full time for about seven or eight years mm. in my early 20s. And then came to a decision in my late 20s that this was not a sustainable way of making a living. I think at that stage, I had my first daughter was on her way. You know, things like school fees and also the lifestyle that went with being a musician in those days, and I'm sure it's still the same now, is not one that is very conducive to good health generally, I think, mm -hmm. both physical and mental. So I sort of ostensibly retired long ago in 2003, 4, 5. But I've sort of occasionally come out of retirement to do various projects, either albums on my own or, or stuff with Chris Letcher, who I've collaborated with previously. So when you say sort of what drives me to music, I've answered the question by telling you what drove me away from it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say this. When I started, I just had this sort of rush of songs. This was in my late teens and early 20s. I taught myself to play the guitar, having been trained on the classical piano through matric. I did music as a subject to matric. And then I picked up a guitar and I started. My mother actually taught me to play the basics of acoustic guitar. And then I started writing these songs. And I mean, I was young, I was 20, 21, and I started playing them in those little folk clubs. And there was a place called Busker's Music Club, which I don't think runs anymore. And a little bar called Wings in Bramfontein outside Witz, which had original artists playing. And I started sort of doing the scene. And it wasn't long at all, really, that I just got very lucky in that uh, Lloyd Ross of Shifty Records. I actually, it's not true that he picked up on me. I got hold of him. <laughs> and the next thing I just found myself recording this demo in his studio, which at that stage was in Bertram's in Valley Road. And it was then that Urban Creep, the Durban band, was also recording with Lloyd and I met with them. And then I was touring with them and then I had an album out. So I was terribly excited to be sort of part of that scene because I'd grown up and was a big fan of all of the shifty artists like James Phillips and Karkoral and Kwaskumbais and there's a whole lot of them. The Carols, uh, Jennifer Ferguson, people like that. So to have, you know, Lloyd Ross, the person who'd produced all of that, recording me along with all this sort of host of shifty luminary musicians like Ian Herman and Louis Klunga and people like that. Jennifer Ferguson sang on my first album. So when all of that was happening, I kind of thought, well, now I can sit back. I've made it. This is all a person can desire. But then I very quickly realized the life of a songwriter, musician, I think anywhere, but particularly in South Africa in the kind of market where I was always located, which I suppose is the so-called white market is never going to be easy. And I had a very serious misconceptions about what the lives that people like Johannes Karkoral and James Phillips, both of whom are dead, one killed themselves and the other died from too much booze, basically. Yeah. I had misconceptions about what sort of success they were enjoying. Yes. And that hit home quite soon, coupled with the fact that I just never really handled or coped with or enjoyed the other side of the music business, which is, well, this kind of thing, really, but this is different. Yes. But, but talk, you know, talking about yourself and being interviewed and being on radio stations and talking to journalists, I always hated it. Yeah. And I very quickly became known as, you know, a nice album, but you don't want to have a conversation with the guy kind of thing. And I really struggled with it. I mean, I was thinking on the way over here, 
I remember very well, I think it was John Perlman who was doing this, something on SAFM in the afternoons, and I was ushered in. At that stage, I mean, I had a publicist, for God's sake, mm. who, you know, ushered me in and put a press release down in front of, I think it was John Perlman. He was quite young and knew it at the time. And I just went completely blank. He was sort of asking me these questions in a very sort of matter of fact, let's get this out of the way before the news kind of way. Yeah. And I just had this complete derealization moment of like, what is this? Why am I sitting here with headphones plugged in with this person I don't know asking me about, you know, what my songs are about and where do I get my inspiration from? And I literally just went absolute. There was like radio silence on national radio in the afternoon. And I remember being ushered out. The producer saying like to the publicist, you know, does this happen to him often? Kind oh, of thing. No. Yes. <laughs> So I really struggled with all of that. And then I sort of disappeared for a few years. And I'd made friends with Chris Letcher, who is now a music academic at Wits. And I think he's actually moving to Edinburgh University next year. But he was the front man of Urban Creep. And him and I started playing together. While I was recovering from having put my first album out, basically, he and I started working together. And then we tried to sort of make a go of it as an acoustic duo Mm -hmm. playing all the bars and clubs and festivals and whatever you around the country and I think we went overseas once and we made a few albums also with Lloyd but it just felt like this constant I had always had a very complicated relationship with success I suppose and and a, a feeling that I should be getting more recognition than I was and the bitterness that that sort of caused in me and that then made me because I write in my songs about things that go on with me then you know, you end up writing about writing songs and stuff, and you just, it got a bit kind of much. By then, it was a bit sort of the early 2000s, and I just sort of took stock and thought, you know what, I'm not going to make a, a living out of this. Yeah. Then I, there was a sort of switch where music became kind of something different than what it originally was in my mind, which is a fantastic way to communicate emotion, really. You haven't asked me a question yet. <laughs> it's been wonderful because you've been answering the questions that I've been planning to ask you. So it's perfect. I suppose I often think about it and we get a big gig. I mean, Opikopi was one of those for me that when I got into an Opikopi lineup, I was like, this is it. Yeah. I've made it. My life is going to change. <laughs> and then you play the show and it's wonderful. And then everything's the same. Yes. And I suppose every moment that I've had in my own career has been like that, that you think this next thing is the thing that is going to, and then it's just like, oh, everything's the same. Yeah. I mean, I remember when Johannes Karkorl came, he'd been in Belgium, Amsterdam, the Benelux countries, trying to sort of crack it. And he came back here having not really, I think he'd done fine, but he had not sort of become a Steph Bosch or some world famous singer. He came back here and his then manager arranged this tour that he did and I had just put out my first album and they thought it would be a very good idea if I sort of opened for him Mm -hmm. and I remember just thinking you know this is incredible you know I grew up with all those Jonas Karkorl songs and I just thought this is going to be absolutely fantastic and then actually meeting I mean his real name was Rolf but meeting him and hanging out with him I really got on with him and we kind of connected with each other and we'd drive through and he's he owned this little uh, Astra Opal Astra that used to go like lightning. And he, I just I remember him going on the highway saying, oh, I'm going to have to be very rude now. And then he put the <laughs> indicator on and like <laughs> do something incredibly dangerous. But I realized then it was this weird mixture of sort of meeting someone who you just kind of idolize and who was in your mind the equivalent of what Bruce Springsteen would be for someone in the States or, yeah. or something. And seeing that this person is actually really struggling and he's got theaters that are half full of old Afrikaans tannies. He hasn't sort of kept his fame going enough to let him have proper audiences, riddled with insecurity and depression and anxiety and just general kind of unhappiness. Yeah. That was quite kind of eye-opening for me in the sense of the, the kind of disillusionment that I think a lot of South African musicians who do it full time and who carry on doing it full time kind of feel and have to face. And I don't know how they deal with it, to be honest. I mean, I look at friends of mine who are only friends of mine because we were kind of on the scene at the same time, the people from Vonderboom and people who are still just sort of going on, Anu Carstens from the Nude Girls. Yeah. Part of me feels very sorry for them Yeah. because they don't have another arrow in their quiver. Yeah. They don't have another string on their bow, whatever the expression is. Yeah. They've kind of had to do that. And at the same time, just really admiring their 
persistence. Yeah, tenacity. Because, yes, tenacity. I just kind of find myself thinking it must be really hard for them more than fun. Mm. So I don't know about this thing of following one's dream. Because one's dream, like in my case, what music became is really just a way of processing my own emotions. And it's a, kind of an odd thing to expect an audience to think that that's fantastic. Well, I mean, this is the crazy thing, is that I think that's the whole point of it, is because I think that there are a lot of people who do not know how to process their emotions. And as an artist, it's almost part of your job to do it for them, not to process their emotions, but to process your emotions and to demonstrate. And in the demonstration, when someone hears it, it shakes something loose. Well, so when that happens, that is amazing. I agree with you. But more often than not, what I found, especially while, you know, to finding yourself in some pub in East London, mm. or a, a, a gig that was booked by someone who doesn't know any better, <laughs> and, and you're singing your heart out to, you know, people who would actually, you know, you can see on their faces, they'd much rather if you're singing a cover version of <laughs> <Yes>! or something. <laughs> Bridge over troubled water. Yes, anything but what you're doing kind of thing. <laughs> I remember there was a gig in Kimberley where exactly they were basically people who were begging, please just play anything else <laughs> other than your music. So it's very nice that it does happen and when people connect and there's that sort of catharsis and silent understanding that happens. And I do I agree with you that it's supposed to be like that. I think a lot of the time it's not like that. And what I ended up doing is putting a whole lot of myself into the songs and then expecting people to think that the songs were amazing and if they didn't think the songs were amazing then just thinking well it's very clear there's nothing amazing about me and I'm so I developed a very complicated relationship with my songs and I went through a period of kind of trying to write about something else <laughs> not just me 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 me, me. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was never really able to do it it's a weird almost kind of pathology I've come to think of it as is this desire to give so much of yourself away uh, in, a, in a very vulnerable making way uh, in circumstances where for various reasons some of which may be because what you're doing is actually not that great or even if it is great there are any number of reasons why it's not going to you know sort of catch the zeitgeist or whatever or it's going to annoy people it became quite complicated for me to separate myself from my music mm -hmm. and so when you're putting it on a stage or putting it on a cd and having it played to people it becomes very sort of exposing you know in a way that i found increasingly like difficult to deal with which is what i quite liked about these online covid shows because that was a very different playing experience where the audience is not visible at all yeah and I mean, the one I did with Chris Letcher and our band, we had, you know, well over 100 people watching it. And it was just us in a room and nobody else. It was really quite an ex extraordinary... So, you, you know, if people were talking and playing pool and or whatever they used to do <laughs> in the real venues, you had no idea. Yeah. So you were just totally focused on the performance without the interaction with an audience, which which for me was always, as I say, quite complicated and... I used to be quite an arsehole when it came to audiences. <laughs> I've been one of those audiences. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been there when I stripped my mood and like told people to shut up and like, you in the red shirt? <laughs> I was there at an Opi copy where you walked off the stage because people were talking. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I walked off. Yeah. Ooh, it sounds like I've, I don't remember that particularly. <laughs> it's amazing they had me back if that is what I did. Sounds like me. We'll find out for certain because memory can be notoriously tricky. I took to at some stage when people would stop listening, I would tell the like the rudest, most unacceptable joke I could think of <laughs> <laughs> just to get them to shut up. What's interesting is that a lot of what you describe is feeling fairly triggered, which I get. And a lot of what I've been doing is the working to pull myself back into my body and sit with that discomfort and seeing what the discomfort does. I also understand the desire to be like, this is too uncomfortable. I just have to separate from this. But I think part of the wonder of art, and you don't have to do it for the audience to keep doing that, but I love that you're still making. So there's a life coach I know who says that your purpose in life is to be the best version of yourself. And it's all an uncovering. And it's finding what triggers you and then healing it. That sounds all right from like a way to live your life point of view. 
I think for a lot of musicians and songwriters, it's not about that. I yes. think it is for, for a lot of them, but there's a, the majority of them, there's not all of themselves in an almost sort of inappropriately sort of self-exposure to the point of almost like a kind of madness in a way. Yeah. For me, I think when I look back on it, it puts too much of an expectation on music firstly and on people generally as to like what music means for them. Yeah. Because for a lot of people, music is not much more than, you know, something that gets you to work in the day or there's, there's, it's not the sort of deep, arty, self-learning about oneself experience at all. It's mm. just something to, you know, soothe you through your working day kind of thing. Yeah. And I suppose like the, the genre of music that we work in, like basically pop or rock music, you know, it's quite a sort of specialized niche of it that is devoted to, you know, the sort of Pink Floyd and Leonard Cohen types of, you know, sort of deep and meaningful mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, you can probably tell I just, I've got quite a messed up relationship with music and lots of feelings that'll probably never resolve really about, you know, what could have been and what I wish had happened and if I hadn't done this and if I'd been nicer to audiences and if I hadn't been so arrogant. I remember very clearly another person who was on the scene with me was Karma from Henry VIII. Yeah. I remember sitting somewhere, it was at Chris Letcher and I done this dreadful EP called EP Tombi. We did it at a time when, you know, I had put out this solo songwriting album and he'd been number one on the radio with Urban Creep at the time. I mean, it all just seems so meaningless now. But we had sort of thought, well, now we, we are doing this thing together, these two sort of top songwriters, and we thought it would be a good idea to basically just pull a giant middle finger tongue out at the whole industry. So we put out this CD, which contained one song, which was just full of basically just dissing, changing the names <laughs> of all the bands that were on the scene at the time and making them rude names, like, you know, no more just jingles. And I think we said about no more Henry Eight rhythm sections or stuff. And she said to me, we were at the baseline, she, I remember her sort of walking up to me and looking me very seriously in the eye and saying, you know, your arrogance is going to be your downfall, Mr. Von der Vont. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, she was probably right. But I mean... That EP changed my relationship with South African music. It's the album that got me into really? South African music, yeah. The idea behind it was really just a sort of piss take, like what are these two serious songwriters going to do? It starts with the phone ringing and, and me answering telling Bono to fuck off because we're busy <laughs> I loved it was that the one with Rosette and Vol Blues yes on it? no it was brilliant literally my favourite South African album wow amazing yeah it made us quite a lot of enemies and it got our, our, <laughs> this guy called Steven Siegerman who, who eventually he became that guy who sort of went and found Rodriguez and they made that movie and I think it, yes. it got an Oscar or something I didn't think of much of it as a movie but anyway he said um, he gave it naught out of ten <laughs> no. when he reviewed it, and he said, "What a total waste of talent!" And this is a disgrace. And there was a James Phillips cover on it. We said, he said James Phillips must be turning in his grave. And, yeah, I'm and then, sorry that happened. Oh no! It was at the time. It was sort of quite funny because for some, for some, a particular sort of brand of music journalist at the time got very upset by that album because it was, it was sort of pointing at the naked emperor saying, you know, you, but you don't have any clothes on kind of thing, the idea of the sort of South African music industry. And it, it was at, at the time that they had that expression, the South African music explosion, it's happening kind of thing, you know, we're going to finally crack it on the international scene and everything. And us, me and Chris sort of coming and saying, you know, what a lot of bullshit and this is just a joke and all your bands suck and you all, <laughs> sound, you, you all sound like Matchbox 20 and they didn't like it. There was this journalist, I eventually made friends with him, his name was Hein. He worked for Music Africa and he voted me asshole of the year in Music Africa because of that album. What I loved about E.P. Tombi because it really was just a sort of jokey album. It was sort of a bunch of so-called funny songs that I had that we did together. The best thing about it was the, the liner notes. Chris and I spent a long time trying to make the, the funniest possible liner notes we could. I'm most proud, I think, in all, everything I did with those, the, the liner notes to E.P. Tombi. It was funny. I want to have to go and read them. Don't bother. <laughs> 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 so... For an audience who isn't familiar with your career, yes, what five highlights, it doesn't have to be five, it can be three, it can be ten, would you give 
The highlights were sort of quite few and far between, and some of them were both highlights and lowlights. I remember when Chris and I had started playing together, they put this, you know, the people at Opikopi, the people who arranged it, the owners of the farm, uh, Boer and Tess and their son Boas, and then their daughter and her husband were huge fans of me and Chris particularly. So they would go to great lengths. They really tried their best to make us sort of work. Mm. And I remember one festival they decided, okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to give you a lot of money and you're going to put a whole band together and you're going to put on a show on the main stage <laughs> and like at 8 p.m. You know, and we were always sort of relegated to the top bar or the sort of quiet acoustic thing. So, And they g- did give us a hell of a lot of money. In fact, what I remember about after that show is we had our little envelope and that Chris Chameleon, who was at that stage with the band Boo, he saw how much we got paid and he actually <laughs> I think he had a little fit. <laughs> so they gave us a lot of money and we we had like a horn section and I think we had some strings and we had a double bass and drums and that, but we were hopelessly under-rehearsed and we were hugely excited about it. And there were people from record companies that, because we were looking to get a, a record deal at that stage, I don't yeah. think we hadn't put out any of our CDs and we'd recorded one and we were trying to shop it around and that. And, and we had this on the main stage at eight o'clock at night with like all the lights and being completely under rehearsed and under prepared and like we just didn't do it properly yeah so it was going to be a highlight but it turned into (laughs) it turned into a bit of a low light and then I did things like quite early on I got to go overseas and when I went and played at a a festival in Belgium called the Dronauta Festival which was quite fun Mm. and that we were on the same bill as people like Emily Harris was there and um, Annie DeFranco, you know her? Yeah, she was there. I saw her live. It was amazing. That kind of thing happened at a time when we were very full of kind of what turned out to be quite naive hope that, you know, this was going to be different and we were going to make it and sort of half exciting. But also uh, I look back on it quite sort of wistfully now. I probably do things and approach things a bit differently my constant feeling when I was doing music full time was I'm just not coping with this as a lifestyle. It mm-hmm. was not. It just didn't suit my character really, particularly the stuff you know that goes along with it—the drinking and the smoking and late nights. And I mean, I often say to Chris, the fact that we survived what went on in the late '90s—you know, when you play in Peter Maritzburg and then drink and then drive back to Durban—and it's not—it's not a healthy way to exist. Yeah. And when you're young, it's uh, much easier to do that kind of thing. I mean, the thought of doing something like that now just horrifies me. (laughs) And the fact that I did it. (laughs) I think we put an awful lot of pressure on ourselves to be full-time musicians. We have this idea that we're only respectable and can call ourselves musicians if we're doing it full-time. And do you think that's not right? I think that's not right. I think the point is to create. I have friends who believe that their day jobs make them patrons of their own art. If you can look at it like that, that's fantastic. I would struggle to see myself as a patron of, <laughs> of my art, if I'm, <laughs> if, if I'm honest. I think it's correct, and I think there are all sorts of healthy ways to look at these things. I think that I never was able to, and still am not able to, sort of process it and explain it to myself in a way that kind of makes it okay I still have quite a lot of bitterness in me about just basically as far as I'm concerned not having got the recognition that I I thought I deserved and that I saw that some people believed but you know that's at the same time that up oneself attitude and entitled attitude because as I say who really cares that there's some guy throwing his heart and soul into songs in a corner of a pub somewhere i mean i'm going to talk about soul healing for another second yes, I, no this good. is not what the podcast is about <laughs> is but it brings up for me unconscious desires right which is the belief that essentially all the factors in your life that you are perpetuating yes. all the feelings that you yes. have about things are because you have a view of yourself that you unconsciously desire to keep perpetuating so to see i'm yourself, sure that's completely true I have no, 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 I've got no doubt. I'm not being funny. I'm not saying that I think what I think because it's right. 
I think there's a sort of messed upness about it. And it got worse and worse with me and music particularly, where I would just end up writing these things that I thought, well, look, the only person who actually understands this and what it means is me. And, mm. and that's not art. That is masturbation or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think there are a large section of us who do see you the way you feel you should be seen just so you know that i know that there's a very small group of <laughs> fanatic me fans i do know that and i, I think it's fantastic but yeah. there's just not, not enough of you man <laughs> i absolutely love your honesty it is making me very happy <laughs> So now the part of you that keeps creating. We had a, another, you know what I really enjoyed was that thing. You remember you'd sang a song of mine that I have not been able to find. I can't even remember how it went, but it was a new song that I had never, I don't think I'd ever recorded. It was certainly not around. I have don't have a copy, but you sang so beautifully and you came, was it when you did Opie Copy? Yeah, was it, it was that an Opie Copy, yeah. It was so nice that. Oh, it was so nice. It, it was one of the highlights of my career. Really? Yeah. 100%. Well, I really enjoyed it too. I've had some horrendous things like that. I, did you ever know a, a musician called Annika? Didn't she used to paint? Or somebody used to paint on stage while she was performing? Could very well be. I think so. But I, I had a, also an Opikopi gig, again with the patronage of the Opikopi people. They, they did me and her together, which was an out-and-out disaster. Oh, no. And also I did one with Kurs Kumbais, which was also, you know what that Oaks fans are like? They're mm -hmm. like hardcore and heavy. And I'm making it sound like I didn't rehearse a lot, but I really had rehearsed for this, but Quis Kumbais doesn't really rehearse. Yeah. So <laughs> it was just a terrible gig. So collaborations don't always work, but it was fun what we did together. I'm sorry we didn't do sort more. Of, yeah. Time is young. Yes. We still can. I love your stuff. You've got an amazing voice. Thank you. Well, but this is about me. Yes, it is about you, but you lead me quite beautifully into the next section on collaboration. Oh, good. Besides Chris Letcher, do you do any songwriting collaborations with anyone else, or is it just in performing that you've collaborated? Yes, never. I've never, in fact, even with Chris, very, very few of each of our songs have got the other person on it as far as the writing goes. So we, we generally just wrote completely separately. Yeah. One or two songs where we each added another little bit that we'd written into it. So the songwriting was never sort of collaborative. Mm. And I've often thought being a solo artist like you are, for mm. example, is quite a rare thing, in certainly in South Africa and just generally. Most people are in bands. Yes. And it just sort of happens organically that that, that is how you come to be a musician is you find yourself as you know a keyboardist or a singer or the songwriter or guitarist, whatever, in a band. And... It never, ever occurred to me until much later that I could have been in a band. <laughs> it was always just going to be me as a solo artist. And I think you're kind of the same. You, were you ever in a band? So I do have a band as well. What is your band called? Shotgun Tori and the Hounds. Oh, yes. No, but that's yeah. you. Yeah, Shotgun yeah. Tori. Except Fred, one of the Hounds, he and I write together. So I'll often come with a song. Oh, okay. And then he will be like, hmm... I just would like to rearrange everything. And he's incredibly skilled musically, and I'm much less skilled musically. I'm all about the feeling. Yes, and me too. he's very clever. It's nice to have someone like that. Oh, and so he, 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 what, he sort of crafts your, yeah. your raw songs. And, well, that's kind of what it's been when we collaborate together. Often I'll still do my own stuff, but the last album that we released, we did together. And he did that. He sat down and he was like, okay, this doesn't work here. This chord, that thing that you're doing... Why don't you try this? And there's and it's like, oh, that's actually the chord I really want to oh, play. Really? Yeah, it's amazing. So do I'll you do ever all the feel, Do you ever feel like, oh my God, no, you're just ruining my great idea? I know that if I was in that situation, that's what. Even if the idea was better, I'd still think like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd resent the person for no. daring to change my <laughs> genius. <laughs> Sometimes there is an initial resistance. Yes. But most of the time, he's right. Well, that's fantastic. And do you enjoy working like that? Because I really never have found anyone to work on a song like that. I do enjoy it. I think part of the challenge with collaborating in a, like a band situation is that it curtails your freedom in some ways, which always yeah. kind of makes me nervous. But when I do it, there's this magic when two people who are really skilled at something yes. get together. They both bring something that you couldn't do alone. And when you put that together, it's like a tiny little explosion. And it creates something you couldn't have done. And it's about the song and it is beautiful. Yes, that's very nice. So I've very, very rarely experienced that. In fact, the only person really who's 
sort of imposed anything on any of my songs was Lloyd, especially for that first album I'd done. I had no idea that songs had a kind of structure. You know, I vaguely had an idea that there was a chorus that you said a few times and verses in between, but I didn't know anything about middle eights and bridges and all of that kind of stuff. So Lloyd, when he got hold of my first, he said, like, I'm very happy to record this album, but you need to do some work on this song, this song, this song, and you have to write. He didn't make any suggestions, but he basically said, you know, you can't just have that repeating that and then repeat that and repeat that. It's not, that's not how you write songs. Kind yeah. of thing. <laughs> that's the most, and otherwise, it's always just been this incredibly isolated and private process for me. Yeah. And question, when I've played with bands and other musicians, it's they are there as kind of icing or to put flesh on a fully grown skeleton that doesn't, and if you dare to change the chord, you know, it's, that's out of the question. <laughs> it's not, even if it was a mistake. <laughs> and so your songwriting process, does it follow a normal structure of writing the chords, then the the lyrics or do you is it different every time so i've had i have basically ever since my first album just lived in this constant state of writer's block <laughs> so if a song manages to squeeze itself out it's like a it's like a total miracle because <laughs> i i mean i was saying before we started recording i've basically become this guitar collector i've got this what's turning into like quite a sizable collection of guitars and i don't actually really play them anymore but the point about that being yeah, writer's block. Writing never flowed comfortably at all. Yeah. I was never able to sit down and say, right, now I'm going to write a song. Yeah. So they're more often than not just things that sort of happened by luck or some little idea that's been sitting for a long time that eventually you decide to sit down and do. There was never any kind of formula that I followed. What I did do was basically did a lot of sort of self-editing. So mm. I've done quite a lot of songs that I would just never let see the light of day. Yeah. Which is, a, I mean, people like Chris Combase, for example, he, he is ridiculously prolific. And, you know, there are at least 20 or 30 of his songs that are really great. Yeah. But there's an awful lot that he's done that is absolutely just not good yeah. and shouldn't really be out there really because it's not they're not properly done songs so i've what i was have always been quite good at i think with some exceptions i suppose but generally just making sure that i in five years time will not cringe in embarrassment that i've put some, any particular song out there that's also changing now with youtube and the sort of instant pleasure thing where you just you can it's, it's fine to just especially with a lockdown scenario where you it's fine to just put your cell phone in front of yourself and you play a song and put it in the next thing it's on youtube yeah and then you go back a few months later you think okay a i clearly had a few glasses of wine when i did that <laughs> <laughs> and b i left out the chorus or whatever <laughs> But as far as songs go, I like them to be finished before they are sort of unleashed. Yeah. Isn't, you know what the best feeling is, is when you've finished recording a song and it's done and it sounds like more or less like you wanted it to sound and then, okay, it's done and down and out there. And even if you died, it's still done. Yes. Don't you like that feeling? I've always felt like recording, I'm never as good as I am live. So I've, I always feel a a slight disappointment oh really yeah so i need to do a live recording at some point that would be great what was it like when you first heard your music with other instruments having been recorded was disappointing or did you no, think no. Wow. i mean that that is wow with other people doing it but i always isolate myself that's what we do in photographs you know you only see yourself yes. in the picture it's the same thing yes. on the recording when i listen mostly i can hear myself and all i can hear is my inner voice criticizing my <laughs> vocal takes i could have done that better i i should have done that better i hadn't warmed up enough i you know and again that's what you said earlier about being unrehearsed and unprepped for that one Opie Copy show. Yes. Is I do that consistently and it's self-sabotage. Yes. I'm determined to change that now. Now that I recognize it, it's time. It's time. It's an old me. It's an old person that was there and there's no more space for her. It sounds to me like you are doing a sort of mix of music and self-help. Like in <laughs> <laughs> yes, on the quiet, that's exactly what I'm doing. What this year has made me realize is that uh, whatever it takes to get yourself through whatever you needs to be gotten through, do it. I've always been very judgmental about all sorts of things and approaches to life and religion. And, and the more 
I exist, the more I just think there really is no no room to criticize the the how that anybody uses to try and make themselves feel better. Absolutely. So I used to be, you know, very critical of sort of self help and life coachy stuff and slogans, you know, <laughs> cringy memes and that. And I really am not anymore. I think anything that helps anybody cope. And I'm not talking about substances and that, because I think that is a different, you know, there are, there are self-destructive things you can do which, to, to cope, which are not good and not okay. But anything, you know, even if it seems cringy or schmarmy to one person, if it's helping another person, I think, go for it. Absolutely. I'm glad we're talking now and not 10 years ago. Because <laughs> I feel like you'd have a lot of different things to say to me then. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> Actually, the most important thing, really, is life. I've still got tons of questions here, yes. but the most important thing, before I forget it, is your ultimate why. What inspires you? One of those songs that squeezes out in, in the yes. barrenness of a writer's block. What inspires you? What leads to that? It's very much a desire to make known things that I have thought about and in order to get people to relate to them mm. that for me is a successful song when you've there's a song of mine called home that i've seen i've often seen it makes people emotional mm. makes them feel things and there's a weird like transcendent thing that when it when it happens and with an audience or with someone listening to a recording where they're just completely consumed by and or just a hundred percent involved and in following everything that's being said and it's evoking feelings in them mm. it's all about the feelings i think what the music makes you feel if you make somebody feel something you've kind of succeeded unless they feel that they you know, <laughs> hate you <laughs> want to vote you for arsehole of the year or whatever <laughs> yeah. but but for me that is you've succeeded if you've kind of done that that's what, So whenever anybody, and it, it doesn't happen very often, but when people say, you know, they'll get hold of me out of the people I don't know, and they say, like, that song that you wrote with that line that said that it means so much to me, and I, that really does sort of make it feel worth it in the end. Absolutely. After, after all of it. I've really been in danger of just thinking I've really, I wasted like eight years of my life. I often think, like, mm. God, if I just done the normal thing from when I was 20, my life would have been quite a bit different. <laughs> Thank goodness you didn't. But, yeah, so I, I think I've got to a point where I think that, where mm. I think, well, I'm glad I did it, and I'm, there's a there's a collection of albums that I'm not ashamed of. Or mm. It's been touch and go from time to time. I've just sort of thought this really. And I suppose it didn't help because my first album did it didn't do brilliantly, but it did relatively well. You know, mm. I had songs on the hit parade and all of that kind of thing, so the people did buy it and, and that. But what's happened ever since my first album, I think... The sales have like got less and less and less and less <laughs> with with each album, which is not how it's supposed to go, really. I don't think. I think you're supposed to sell more and more. I think it's a sign of the times, to be honest. Well, people don't buy you. Well, you can't really put out albums anymore. No, I mean, everything's just, free. Yes, but and what I find amazing about that is that people just carry on doing it, and there's really, really good music. People are making amazing music now. Do you watch those NPR Tiny Desk concerts? I love them. Yes, they're so good. Mm. The youngs, the young ones, yeah. <laughs> oh, they're, so, they're so good, and they're just doing it. And I'm quite sure they're not making a huge amount of money. Yeah. Even the ones who get onto the NPR tiny desk concerts, you, you know, you have to have a following to do that. Mm. It says something about the fact for a lot of people who do it seriously, and that it's not about success financially. Yeah. It's a, it is a, there's something of a calling about it, coupled with her world. What else are you going to do? Absolutely. I mean, I was quite lucky because when I saw the writing on the wall, I thought, I'm going back to university, and I did law. Yeah. And law is a funny profession because in lots of ways it's quite conservative. There's room for the eccentric lawyer. Yeah. I think I'd do a pretty good eccentric lawyer on the whole. So I was lucky to have something else. And a lot of people, I think, don't have anything else. Yeah. Do you have anything else? I do, but I'm… You want to do music. But I want to do music. Yeah. I do. I studied broadcasting in London. And so I, I'm a video editor and I do that kind of stuff. And I suppose it's, it's nice to be able to have something when, for instance, COVID, mm. when there was nothing, there were no gigs. I don't know how most people survived without, most musicians survived without support from their parents or savings or those live no. streams. And still those live streams 
I mean, I did a few. They weren't really well supported. I appreciated the experience, but, you know, it's not going to save the ship. No. So I was lucky, really lucky to be able to do some other stuff as well. So, you know, my dad always said it's important to have something to fall back on. Yeah. Which my teenage self disagreed wholeheartedly with, but I I did it anyway. Um, And I was glad for it and I have consistently been glad for it. But I suppose if you identify with being a musician full time as the only thing that's valuable, then that can really mess with your head. Right. If you are fluid and it's like, okay, well, I am a musician, even if today I'm doing a little bit of editing. For me, when I say I want to focus more on music, I mean, I want to put the hours in. Yes. Because... You can lose track, you know, you lose sight of your ultimate goal. If you don't do it all the time. So with the thing you were talking about earlier about, you know, people who think you have to do it full time, otherwise you're not a real musician. Mm. I agree with you that that is probably a foolish way to look at it. But I think there's an element of truth to it. Because when you're devoted to it and you're needing to do it for a living and mm. it's all you do, then it's all you do and you give it your full attention. And it doesn't become you know, like this co- guitar collecting hobby where, where you don't actually spend any time or spend a decent amount of time actually doing it. Because when you stop doing it, it's very hard to get back into it. I mean, totally. I've had periods where I've not played for a year or so, and where I've had to sort of pick up a guitar and learn my own songs again and <laughs> to play, and that. it's really hard. The truth of it is when you can focus on something is when you are successful. It's mastery. Yes, that's exactly it. And those, yeah, and that's where I agree with you. And I suppose if you have to do stuff on the side, you still have to put in four hours a day on, I was talking to Jay Bones about it and I said, you have to put in four hours a day. This is my goal. I'm going to try five days a week, four hours a day. This is what the scary killer says from the one thing. This is what you do. And he's like, three times a week, 45 minutes, you'll be fine. <laughs> That's like, is he not talking about gym? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the same thing, the same muscles. I mean, different muscles, but muscle. When I uh, was seeing the psychiatrist years and years ago, and I was trying to persuade him that I was doing music for a living was a viable proposition. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I wrote a song about that uh, called Cause Lost, which goes, you know, your dream is a cause lost an albatross, get a real job, is what the, the white coat says. And his whole thing was, you know, if, if you say you're doing music as a profession like you are saying then you know you wake up at eight o'clock in the morning and you do voice training for two hours and then you play your guitar for three hours and and I was saying well you know like no not really you maybe wake up at 11 (laughs) (laughs) have about seven cups of coffee and then it gets to about three and then you like put the cat out and then maybe you you know pick up a guitar for 20 minutes and then you watch a bit of tv and that's (laughs) He was trying to persuade me that, you know, you need proper structure. And, you know, if you're being a professional musician, you have to do, you know, what professional musicians do, like yeah. like people in the, the, the London Philharmonic or whatever. Mm. But I, I don't think he really got the kind of rock and roll vibe that I was, try- <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to explain, you know. No, 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 no. <laughs> but he raises a fair point. Yes. Because if where well, you want to be a success at anything, you want to – Give it your devoted attention because energy goes where attention goes. And I think that's what success comes from. And that's one of the things that I feel like I need to learn now. Well, I think if you're able to do that, that's brilliant. And I've never been able to really do that with with music. Mm -hmm. Just because there's something quite arbitrary about like when songs come out. I've never been able to to just sit down and decide right now I'm writing a song and then actually had a song come out that's worth anything. Mm-hmm. A friend of mine, you know Lucy Kruger? Yeah. I, says, I like her whole vibe oh, and band. Oh, she's wonderful. And she... How is she doing? They have gone to Berlin now. Yeah, yeah we've got it. we did an episode with her and she is one of the best collaborators. And if you ever get a chance to collaborate with her, she creates magic. She brings it. You can kind of tell that about her though. Yeah. There's quite a lot of like mystique there. And incredible skill skill with vocals everything vocals guitar songwriting oh really yeah she cares so and that guy she plays with andre do they still play together so i think they do the odd thing as the lost boys but medicine boy disbanded oh really yeah but what i was gonna say is lucy had said to me i was in a fairly dark place in my life and she had arrived at my house one day and she looked at me and she said you have to do morning pages and at the time, right. I didn't know what that was. And I'm sure you've heard of Morning Pages. So I did that course, Artist's Way, yes. you know, Julia Cameron. That's where it comes from, exactly. 
And when I did that course, I wrote an, a vast number of songs. The whole of the, the an album I did uh, called Bignity uh, with Chris. Yeah. All of those songs came from doing that course and doing the morning pages. Yes. So I was about to say, I why don't you restart again, morning pages? You know what happened to me with that course, and I'm not joking. I tell the story, but it is true. I was doing that course, and it was I was really getting a hell of a lot out of it. And then, just out of curiosity, I sort of turned to the end of the book, <laughs> and there, there's this poem, which is supposed to, I think it's what Julia Cameron, it's a poem that she wrote, yeah. having done this course, and it was like one of the worst poems I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've ever read. And then I just sort of gave up on the on the course, and and also, so I say I wrote some quite nice songs while doing that course. I also wrote some absolutely shocking ones that were so that, that I truly believed were very good and which I sort of brought to Chris and he was like, oh my God, have you become like a reborn Christian or something? So, <laughs> so, so there were, so, but anyway, morning pages, I do agree where you just write stream of consciousness, yeah. don't have to make any meaning, just as hand on paper. Mm. It is very good. And it's, you know, it's about discipline, which I have always really lacked. And that's, it's what appealed to me about the music world. When I look at who I like, the sort of the hard rockers and the Quiscom basses and that theme were these people who like didn't really fit in into yeah. the real world very well and had found some hidden deeper truth that didn't involve you know washing your feet and stuff you, you could walk around looking almost like a tramp yeah. kind of thing and you don't need ambition ambition is for losers kind of thing you know mm. you don't want to succeed you're a loser and you accept it but you you know you the, the, what's that neil young line about meet the losers in all the best bars and the winners in all the dives you know <laughs> this thing like, oh, no, i'm a, i mean i'm, a, I'm a basically a baggy but i'm i'm still a winner because you know, I don't. I hate the system and all of that stuff. I that is what very much appealed to me about the, the sort of music world is this idea where you didn't have to be ambitious yeah. and you could just be sort of emotionally honest, even if you were actually quite lazy. Both lazy as far as writing goes, and as far as being lazy with your emotions. Also, it, it also applied. But there, so there was an element of like the slacker vibe that got me into music that thought well this is an okay way to make a so-called living yeah. you sort of you know you don't have to really apply yourself and you just write you know as much as you can kind of thing and mm. see see where it takes you so so there's something to that idea of doing it properly and seriously with 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 your will directed at it completely yeah like so you know well if you want to be creative you do morning pages and you do an exercise you know in the mid morning and you you have your artist's date and all of that stuff yeah it makes sense there's a huge like cynical policeman that lives in my head all the time that i just i cannot for me i'm talking mm, about absolutely the concept of that julia cameron's artist date i just it makes me it makes me feel cringy. I can't actually tell myself I'm going on an, a date with my inner artist now. <laughs> then you pick flowers in the garden and or whatever it is, you know, count dewdrops on nasturtium leaves or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but I do think it's good to do that stuff. I wish I was less cynical about it. Even the, the sort of self-help stuff. Mm. I mean, I could probably use some self-help, <laughs> but there's something, there's something in me that, you know, when I just read the sort of way that it's framed, I find it, and you know what it is a lot, it generalizes. Mm, absolutely. What's good for one will necessarily be good for the other. Everyone has to have an artist date kind of thing. <laughs> well, not me. <laughs> <laughs> So now we've spoken about some of the challenges. I mean, it's been so interesting to hear you speak about it. What do you think the challenges that musicians today are facing? I always think, as I was saying, I look at people like Arno. I mean, I remember being in a... I can't remember what it was. Oh, there was. it was a James Phillips tribute thing, also at Opikopi, and there was lots of rehearsing mm. happening for it. And there was a band that was put together... And I did one or two songs with the band, and he did a song. And that was the first time I'd sort of seen him like in the flesh in person and mm. he picked up this microphone and started belting out one of these James Phillips songs and I just thought like the talent yeah. that was just emanating from this guy was incredible so yeah. was hugely talented and I think now I don't know I would follow him on Twitter and I occasionally say how's it to him or whatever I imagine that he's struggling terribly mm. and have, and then you look at people like Simba Mori who got sick mm. and fundraiser for him 
I see Gary now. There's Gary Herselman. There's a there's a fundraiser for him. I think musicians generally, and anyone who basically is tied to that life, yeah, in this country and others, but particularly here, and particularly this sort of scene here, not the DJ scene. I think you know people like Black Coffee and that do fine, mm. but the basic songwriting musician here. And this cuts across race and colour in South Africa, I think, yeah. are really, really struggling and having a terrible time. Mm. I mean, I felt odd, and I suppose it's just because I hardly play live anymore, but it, it felt odd to, because I had two fairly successful, well-attended shows that I did one solo during lockdown through... Um, home stage. Home stage, and, and then one which was done with uh, Bill Wirtas and Lloyd and Julian. I was quite lucky to have like quite well attended shows, and because I got a day job, I wasn't really doing it for the money anyway. Yeah. But I saw a lot of people arranging shows and doing Facebook Live things and that, which really just were not well attended. And yeah. I mean, if you're doing that for your living and your bread and butter, I don't know how you don't get completely demoralised by it. it. Starts to feel like begging. Yes, it starts to feel like begging. Mm. What I think musicians are struggling with at the moment is basically the fact that people don't want to, or now that they, even that they can go out, I mean, there are no proper venues to play in, really. Mm. There's a few that, that spring up from time to time. Yep. And I mean, so I went to see, do you know Tim Parr? Yes. I went to watch his band play, and it was so good, but there were so few people there, and I just thought, well, this isn't like, it's not good for the venue, it's not good for Tim, it's not good for, for anybody. <sighs> It's again the word demoralizing comes up. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I count myself quite lucky that I've been, for whatever reason, as much as I wanted to, I never really stopped doing music. But I'm very glad that I don't rely on it to make a living because I, I think it would really depress me. It would bleak me out. <laughs> I mean, I think it's going to need a whole new restructuring of the entire model. Yeah, and I don't know what that looks like yet, but I think. We as creatives are responsible for making something new and sustainable. So this is part of the reason. These are the questions, you know, how are we going to do that? So shouldn't people make albums still and not give them to the Spotify's and YouTube music and those platforms? Why are those platforms now the place where you put your music? Because it's nice for consumers. Nice to get free stuff. We've come to expect it. Yeah. And it's the same thing. When a musician plays a gig for free... It kind of devalues the entire yeah. system. And that's what it's come to, is that somehow, and I don't know how you break away from that. I don't know if it's, it's every, all the musicians say, hey, we're all not going to do that anymore. Or, but there's so many musicians and so many people who just want to be heard mm. that there's got to be another way. We've got to get creative. So I, this is going to sound very old fashioned, but my idea would be to actually, you only have music on vinyl albums now it's not available on the internet the internet is where you look at pornography and <laughs> have your political say on facebook or whatever <laughs> you can't get music on online and if you want to listen to music you buy a vinyl album we're too far away from reality these days in all respects yeah. No, you used to, and I'm, now I'm really sounding like an old fart, I know. But you know that thing where you take the record arm and you put it on and you, there's a needle that picks up sounds and grooves? It's very real. I've become a, a total vinyl fan. Wonderful. It's very real. And I know it doesn't sound better than CDs. And the reason it sounds warm is because all you're getting is a big, you know, bass uh, rumble from the pickup and that. But there's some things I find... I far prefer listening to music like that yeah. than, than finding it on my phone and putting it through Bluetooth. I'm completely with, the, I think it's Neil Young and them who's saying, I'm not prepared to have my music listened to like this. Yeah. The sort of ultra compressed, low megabytes per song, like, you know, a song, of, a song should not be three megabytes big. So, so MP3s and Bluetooths and that I'm completely against. Yeah. I'm not an activist about it. It's just what I think. Yeah. I mean, it's so interesting because I think there are benefits of, of technology and we have a global reach that we've never had. Yes. And I do believe that we can build our communities and that unfortunately requires that we get online. But I don't have the answer myself. So I feel like these questions are important to ask. Yeah. And somehow 
we are going to find a way to restructure this model. One of the problems is that the artists have never really been in charge of it. It's always been record companies who sort of run the show. Yeah. I don't think artists are very good activists and they're not very good organizers. And <laughs> and as you say, most of them just are desperate to be heard. Yeah. What I always find amazing is when you go to a site like Bandcamp, you've bought a few things there and then it's picked up on the kind of things that you like. There's like an oversupply of good music. There's like too much music to actually, good music, yeah. there's quite a lot of shit also, but there's too much good music for one person to sort of consume. Yeah, agreed. So maybe the answer is the artist should just stop writing for a few years. <laughs> <laughs> or completely, is that right? Okay. <laughs> well, I think that in America they say the riches are in the niches. I mean, I obviously know that's not how right. you pronounce niche, yes. but the riches the are in the niches. The riches are in the niches. <laughs> Exactly right. <laughs> you were developing and nurturing your own small community. Yes. And it's a loyal community. And I suppose in the genre of music that we make, we see that. Mm. I have friends who feel like they have one fan, one mm. loyal fan. And it's about turning that one fan into 10 fans, yes. into 100. And those fans are not fans. They become friends because there are so few of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I get I get what you're saying. It does get awkward. Though. I mean, we had Chris and I at one stage had this following of people that all come together. It would be like six or seven of them, and they'd all like sit in the front and mouth the words to all of the songs and stuff. And it was very nice and sweet, and like they were very just loyal fans. And then one of them said, "Like I'm having a birthday. Will you come and play at a party?" And it was the most excruciatingly <laughs> awkward. It was like this lamb spit bry, and you know we were there like on their stoop. Yeah. Playing. And I was, you know, in some ways it's sort of sweet in that, but in another way, so I think it's right about the village thing and take care and get, <laughs> make it, try and have as many fans as you have friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, I think it's, it's a hard thing. And maybe, I'm not sure, music has, was never commercialized before the pop era, really. Yeah. I mean, it was always this, there were these, eccentric geniuses who got paid and who, who had patrons that would look after them for writing music for them. Mm. And maybe that's a way that it should and could work. The idea of music being sort of commoditized was quite a recent one, I think. Yeah. When, from when they invented records, basically. See, and you love them so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they are the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I've just flatly contradicted myself in the space of five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> any more questions? <laughs> so, do you have anything lined up? Any, any gigs or anything? Music-wise, you, you know yeah. what? I, what I did is I bought an electric guitar. Now I've said I'm, and I've started playing around on it. And I bought Guitar Rig Six. And it's quite a big thing for me because I've never played electric. Mm. So at the moment, what I've got lined up is is just I've got the guitar, a uh, Fender Strat hooked up to the computer, and I'm hoping to try and write something. Yeah. When Chris and I played, we got this very nice band together with Andrew Joseph and a guy called Nicholas Bjorkman, Victoria Hume, Chris's yeah. wife. Chris and I each did a new song for that, and Victoria writes beautiful songs, mm. very sort of serious songs but lovely and she's got a beautiful voice so anyway the idea is to get those recorded before Chris because I think they're buggering off to Edinburgh Chris is going to go and work at the university there yeah there was an idea that's supposed to be happening now that we're going to record two or three new songs each and do Wonderful. something with it as far as playing goes I mean, it was quite ironic and weird that I became somebody who actually did those online shows and they kind of worked because I was not playing at all before the lockdown happened. And, mm. I, and since having done those, which I really enjoyed those two shows, but I, I don't really have any plans to play live immediately. The prospects of playing in one of these clubs now, you know, where you've got to sit six feet apart from everybody else, nice. and I do, it doesn't appeal to me much. Understandably. And you? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm slowly gathering some shows. And are you writing? Every day. Are you? Yeah. I've restarted. I, I mean, I'm doing morning pages. I'm committing. Well, that's fantastic, I yeah. think. That's yeah. very good. I mean, it's the only way I'm going to get any better, right? By doing it every day. Yeah. And practicing scales, right? 
I'm not very good at that. Are so you that's, practicing skills? I'm practicing skills, yeah. On the guitar? On the guitar. I had a, my first jam session with Fred last night again, which is also why I'm reminded of why the music is so magic when you connect with someone who is good at it and who you like and mutually yes. respect. He played me something new he'd written, and it was like, it was beautiful. And he's like, I said, let's write that then. I'll write the lyrics, let's do it. And he said, okay, cool. Well, then you do this part that I'm doing. I was like, um. (laughs) He's like, no, no, it's just this. And he's like, and I'm like, just that. (laughs) So I was like, well, let me film it. So I filmed it. And my mission is to just sit with it. And work it out. And work it out because it's impossible. It seems seems (laughs) impossible. And it's like, he seemed to think that I could do it. So scales. I'm trying to get my fingers right on scales so that I can just, be better at this and stop sabotaging myself well i really hope i mean i think you're great so i really hope you do it and as i say anybody who's sticking this out is they get my respect (laughs) or or pity or something (laughs) (laughs) respectful pity (laughs) i'll take that i will take your respectful pity (laughs) okay so a song that you wish that you had written oh there's lots of those Mm. Do you know a band called Car Seat Headrest? They're no. quite obscure. It's this young kid. He's like, I think he's 19 now, mm. writing the most amazing rock songs. There's a song that he wrote called Drunk Drivers and Killer Whales. I do not know. I could know be making this up completely. <laughs> <laughs> no, no it really does exist. Yeah. And uh, so I, uh, that's the, the most recently the song that I thought, God, because it even, it's got a little bit of – my approach to it, like a sort of slightly anarchic, intense emotional stuff. Yeah. And lyrics that sound like they're sort of written just before you drop off to sleep kind of thing, like very evocative uh, lyrics. So that's, and then a song that everyone would know that I wish I'd write just about anything by Leonard Cohen, I think. Like, totally. Like Everybody Knows, I think is the most amazing song. <sighs> Wish list. Collaboration. Who would you love to collaborate with? Well, I've said I'd like to collaborate with you again. I would really like that. So we should make it happen. I'm, I'm, we're going to. That would be really nice. Yes. Yeah. And then we can... Vaccine permitting. We can make a show. Yes. Yeah. Because I, I feel like there's got to be a new model, right, which we've spoken about. And I don't think it's necessarily in these little venues. But I, I wonder if it might be in theatres. And I wonder if it might be in big gardens. Yes, outdoors in a big garden. Yeah, in beautiful spaces. Mm. No, so I would be keen to do that. And I need to, I'm lazy with writing. I really am. I really struggle with what feels to me like the pointlessness of it. I'm doing Mm. it solely for myself. And actually, I'm not really doing it for myself because the purpose of it is to communicate with other people and no one really cares so <laughs> why bother that's that's kind of how my mind works I think, okay well i'm gonna go make coffee or something realistic collaborations we've just arranged it yeah. an unrealistic one so i'm an unashamed roger waters fan yes. and i would do anything and he is also very much a he's like quite a crap guitar player <laughs> plays he's a good bass player but you know like when he plays the acoustic guitar he could use some help. He needs <laughs> <laughs> to be fantastic to do something. With. And I just sort of admire his whole, I mean, he's now old. He's like in his 70s and he's still touring and he's in good shape. And he's sort of, he's doing it like as a professional should kind of yeah. thing. He's obviously looking after himself and he sorted his, all of his psychological stuff out. Wonderful. Yeah. I mean, isn't that the goal? Very much so. Yeah. To not end up feeling bitter and twisted. <laughs> Yes, that would be really nice. (laughs) In light of everything we've spoken about, what advice would you give to artists who are doing it, the ones you both respectfully pity and the new ones just starting out? So I really love it when... I've been to the uh, the, what's now the Makunda, the Grahamstown National Arts Festival the last few years. Yes. And I found myself in venues where young up and coming artists are going. And I just, I remember the feeling so well and what it feels like. Mm. So, despite everything, it gives me a lot of pleasure to see a youngster sort of doing it and, and 
just there's a sort of gay abandon about the way they because they just think they the you know that feeling when you're just quite sure that anything that you're strumming out of your guitar is the best thing that anyone's ever done on any guitar yes. and they're so sort of confident and and so i would never say to somebody who's going through that like you shouldn't be doing it yeah. <laughs> you're wasting your time <laughs> you're gonna get hurt <laughs> <laughs> this is not going to end well. So I would never say that. So that what, what, what? <laughs> so the not advice before the advice. Y- yes, yes. <laughs> Carry on what you're doing. It's fine <laughs> for a start. <laughs> what you're doing is okay, and I understand it. If you want some inspirational advice, I don't know. You'd have to maybe speak to Tori. She'll <laughs> she'll she'll tell you something out of uh, the artist's way. <laughs> she'll tell you to keep doing it confidently don't stop doing it I, I would, so i'd never tell anybody to stop because ultimately you kind of have to believe that even even though you there are a smattering of people who think what you're doing is worthwhile ultimately you have to think that there is a point to it to have created anything that is not out of shit is <laughs> <laughs> worth it and, and valuable i think but uh, there are also a lot of people that i've seen who i just think you are being like somebody else you're not being yourself Mm. there's a whole lot of dishonesty and fakery going on and that makes me quite angry actually i think it was at the jazz thing but there were just there was a a string of young talented black songwriters Mm. who were just so good and clearly they had a following i hadn't heard of them so Mm. because i'm not really in that scene but I just thought, wow, these oaks are really good and there's no way I'd tell them, like, stop you wasting your time yeah. kind of thing. But I don't think it really fits in my mouth to give anyone advice about what you should do if you want to succeed as a musician. So it's, <laughs> it's not, I can tell you what not to do if you don't want to end up like me. But <laughs> I think what is important is, you know, there is a unique thing to South Africa. Mm-hmm. It's a unique country and place in that so i get very annoyed when i hear people just sounding like they're from somewhere else like they could be in the midwest in the states or you wouldn't be able to tell i think it is important to have some sort of cultural honesty about where you're from whether it's the white suburbs or the townships or what or the rural kzn whatever yeah i mean i think the people who are going to make it if anyone does from south africa are people who are doing something fresh and new and not just you know trying to sound like what's on the parade all of which is basically american and british pop absolutely so now if anyone wants to hear your music and find you what channels can they go look on social media where are you there's some stuff on youtube and there's stuff on Bandcamp. shifty records has got all of my stuff i did solo and with chris and then there's a separate section of the albums that i did post shifty my solo albums also on Bandcamp. And I've got a SoundCloud page that I just post whatever I've been working on recently, like demos of... It's quite fun to go back to kind of years later, sort of demos of songs that ended up being recorded. That's quite nice. So anyone who wants to, well, they'll find me if they Google me. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah, not, don't go to the lawyer's page. That is me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of selling people as, are you the same Matthew for one that did music when, when I'm about to get them divorced or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> do you have an Instagram? I do, but I don't use it. I've never really understood Instagram. Is yes. it just photos that you post? You can post videos as well. So how does it differ from Facebook? Oh, it's just more beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Facebook owns it now, but it's just aesthetically more pleasing, I find. I don't understand those things myself. I just know that I really like to look at pretty things and I like to post pretty things and not all the things are pretty and sometimes you have to find a way to speak to your audience right I don't know if anybody listens sometimes I get a few likes but But do you put put your music on there on Instagram not really I mean if I do something cool like make anything and then you can make the link clickable app in the bio in the profile and you just say you know link in bio okay and then people can go in there and find you and listen I, I suppose I'm, you've just got to make it accessible. I've, be, well, I've become very sceptical and cynical about social media generally. I mm. think it's incredibly bad for us. Yeah, no, I agree. I'm not enjoying it. It kind of upsets me. Mm. And I've got into some very nasty, <laughs> unexpected spats with with people that I would never have thought that I would be. And it's, it's all to do with the way that people communicate on those platforms mm. and that, which is not – I don't think it's the way we should be speaking to each other. Oh. I know that it is – 
and it is how it is, but it is there's something very toxic about a lot of it. Yeah. And more so. I mean, nowadays, reading comments on a Daily Maverick article today about the the, the vaccine that's been shown to be 90%, and dialogue happening is along the lines of, oh, great, so we now we've got a vaccine that's 90% effective against something that 99.5% of people survive. The, people just don't sort of understand this, yeah. this idea of democratizing platforms, <laughs> allowing everyone to say whatever they want. I don't know. I'm not sure. It's, it's like talk radio. It's not a good idea. <laughs> Should only let some people talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, I'm inclined to agree. Oh, are you? Over- yeah. No, I, see, this is the thing. I'm very good at burying my head in the sand. So if people don't talk nicely to each other, I just click off because it upsets me. Right. So I just don't read the things because it hurts my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> so I pretend it's not happening. Yes, no, it's not for the sensitive at Mm-mm. those places. Lots of people have found a way to manage. I tend to like bleed onto it much too much, you know, mm. just heart on sleeve and say what I think and then... Upset more people. Yes, <laughs> we really have forgotten how to talk to one another properly. Yeah, we have. That's why it was nice to do this. Thank you for joining us. But now, I mean, you're not on social media. If you were going to do a show, how are people going to find out? Oh, so no, I am. I'm on Facebook and Twitter and oh, whatever. You okay. So the, the power of that to get people to gigs if you haven't played for a, a long time is quite amazing, I find. And the, I mean, the last few gigs I've done have just been advertised on Twitter, Facebook. What are your handles? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, search in Facebook Love under. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Matthew von Devant. There's a music page which I update occasionally. There's something called Matthew von Devant's music. Oh, that's amazing. Well, I'm going to find out all these links and I'm going to put them in the show notes. So it's going to be easily clickable for anyone who is listening to the show and is keen to go find out more. Cool. We start a village. Yes, I'm into that. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. It's been really fun. If you are an indie artist whose passion for what you do can inspire or fuel others, get in touch. I'd love to chat. You can find me on Instagram at Shotgun Toy. You've been listening to another production from Solid Gold Podcasts. How do I get you down? And how do I, do I come back? Allow you over or around without your love, without a sound I doubt my feet without the ground now I'm hanging over you sorry I am blue but this is how I get you back get me out let you down Down to hanging on my own Sorry I am blue About you now the cutting down Allows through every crack I have to doubt No love, no light, no sound Without your light, without your sound Without your love to cut me down To fall between the semi without your love, without your sound, I thought my feet would touch the ground. The cloud is hanging over you. Sorry.